Ron Gilson from Columbia Law School and the Stanford Law School. In some ways, um, uh, San Francisco, the Silicon Valley, and Israel uh, are closer together intellectually uh, than any other uh, than any other two uh, places uh, in the world. Um, but that's true only in state of mind and electronically. <laughs> if you've actually got to move from one to another, uh, it takes a, a uh, long time. I should note that the substantive, the substantive connection between Silicon Valley and in, in Israel is interesting because it ties into something that Zohar just said. That is, in both jurisdictions, the role of entrepreneurs and the role of founders of firms figure very prominently in what the structure of organizations are. So it's yet another reason um, to link the two. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, uh, a subject that in a way uh, reflects Zohar as well, that is the, um, the increasing unimportance of agency costs, uh, as a, of traditional agency costs as a way of understanding uh, our received body uh, of corporate law. It's framed, if you could reason, read that, uh, with in terms of whether Berlian means is fractal. That is, does the notion of diverse, um, of diverse ownership carry the same weight when the diversity is among minority shareholders and there is a controlling shareholder uh, as well. Now, uh, I want to set the background a little bit. There we go. And I want to tell a very short version of, of the U.S. history, uh, not because there's anything special about U.S. law, but rather because in terms of its capital market, uh, it's, a little, uh, uh, it's a little further uh, going forward. And what I want to talk about uh, is uh, uh, equity intermediation. That is, the own increasing ownership of equity by intermediate, intermediary institutions who are record owners, not beneficial owners of the companies. Uh, think of it as mutual funds, but they're wider than that. And I suppose I should make one, um, one disclosure issue. Um, from time to time, I wear a different hat on the independent share of a sort of moderate size of family of uh, mutual funds, um, which mostly gives me a, um, uh, a sort of a vision from the inside because my compensation uh, is unrelated as near as I can tell to anything. Um, so what we've seen is a really quite remarkable shift in ownership structure in the U.S. Uh, in 1950, Berlian Means had the U.S. ownership structure down exactly right. 5% of publicly held stock was owned by, uh, was owned by uh, institutions. If we roll that far forward, and it, it's, it's somewhat linear starting around 1950, um, at present um, there are uh, roughly of the top 1,000 companies, something north of 70% 70, 70 of outstanding public company stock is owned by an intermediary. Uh, institutions. Uh, why has this happened? Two easy reasons. The most important uh, is we shifted after World War II the way we save for retirement in the United States. It's probably had the largest impact on corporate governance of any policy move that we've ever made. It was made absolutely without regard uh, to the governance uh, implications. The second is uh, simply reflects uh, a point that uh, the Chief Justice made that the development of modern finance theory taught us all that diversification mattered enormously. And we've started investing in mechanisms which give us high power diversification at very low costs. The result was to concentrate ownership, uh, it was to concentrate ownership in these intermediary institutions that act on behalf of their beneficial owners. Um, so two, uh, two implications uh, that I'll come back, that will, that will guide what I'm talking about. The first is that governance structures that were suited to the old ownership structure, focusing in Zohar's terms on agency costs, are unsuitable to the new ownership structure. They just don't read on that factual circumstance. The second and the other important thing, it's it's sometimes harder for lawyers uh, to internalize, 
is that the causation with respect to governance changes runs from the capital market to governance, not the other way around. So if the structure of capital markets is pushing ownership in a particular direction, the most that the courts and legislators, frankly, or judges can do is kind of nudge it in a little way, one way or the other. It can't stop it. Okay, so just to, to make the points, I'm going to show you two, two slides with some numbers, uh, mostly to show I'm honest. The first is just, uh, it's a little out of date, but the numbers have gotten worse. Standard slide basically showing the percentage of held by institutional uh, shareholders of various tiers uh, of, uh, the, of US publicly held corporations. In the top 50 in 2009, it was a little over, single, almost two thirds, uh, down for smaller companies up to 73%. Well, uh, that's interesting, but, if there are a million institutions, maybe we've just got diverse institutions and nothing changes. Um, the problem is, or the, the fact is, but it's not necessarily a problem, is that own institutional ownership is extremely concentrated. So here's some numbers for um, the uh, 10 largest US companies without a controlling shareholder, whether Microsoft belongs in there uh, kind of depends on what the Delaware Supreme Court says about what's a controlling owner, but it, it, it doesn't change this. There's nothing unusual. And the numbers, again, have gotten worse. This is the percentage held uh, of these companies of, by the lar 25 largest institutional owners. Um, so uh, Apple, my favorite company. Um, it's 37%. It's 37% here. It's, it's certainly over 40. Uh, now, uh, if we, banks, uh, Wells Fargo is a good example. Uh, where is Wells? Uh, 45%. What this suggests is that around the table of a not very large boardroom, you can put a represent one person representing each of the institutions, uh, and you've basically got control of You've got control of the company in that room. That's not burly and means. Um, and uh, it's not burly and means. We have concentrated ownership, but concentrated owners ownership by record owners who have a ben who are have a fiduciary duty toward their own investors. So it's not just this hierarchy that we're used to. Kind of looks like uh, kind of looks like a triangle. Um, an enormous amount flows from that. Um, think about the 1980s uh, and takeovers and a bunch of Delaware law that um, flows from the notion that well, shareholder boards know better than shareholders, and shareholders can make mistakes because we got diverse shareholders. And how much is it worthwhile for them to learn? Um, we got a bunch of really smart shareholders. Whether whether we like what they do or think they're smart or not, it's a different question. But it's not because uh, it's not because they're dumb. The 1980s world, when we first got this long-term versus short-term mantra was a much calmer world because in the 80s, hostile takeovers meant you actually had to buy something which limited the size of the companies that were subject to it. Active shareholder activism, now it's wonderful, it scales. That is, I, don't, I have to talk to the same number of shareholders to vote if I'm a Bill Ackman. For a mid-cap company, or for a Fortune 500 company. So it's what's the impact of this concentration of ownership is a perfectly good example, has meant that everybody, so an, an activist can make a run at Microsoft when it couldn't buy it in a thousand years. So um, one way to think about it, DuPont, uh, which I, which I love, uh, I love the, DuPont, the recent DuPont um, uh, uh, takeover, a uh, part of it because it's like the only Delaware company left. Um, but 52.48, what? 
Well, I mean, it was the only one. This isn't a recent event. Uh, in fact, Henry says it's a good thing. Uh, but DuPont is fascinating. 5248, the institutions split. The fight wasn't over whether management was incompetent enough. It's whether they were moving fast enough. And so we're not done with this yet. But the system may well have worked pretty well. I don't know whether it's long term or short term. That is, if the world is moving fast and markets are changing quickly, the danger of management being hyperopic is probably worse than the market than the market being myopic. But the framing long term versus short term kind of gets us uh, without more kind of gets us no place. Okay, so now I want to get to the interesting stuff and what have, may have more relevance uh, in Israel and where Israel is likely to be ahead of the United States uh, rather than the other way around. Um, so uh, in, a, in a system with a, uh, with a controlling shareholder, the, the problem Zohar laid out was um, between the controlling shareholder uh, and the minority. Do we make sure that the controlling shareholder is sufficiently far-sighted? Is the controlling shareholder diverting too many, uh, too many assets uh, to themselves? And here's the point where the Berlian means issue comes up. Let's make an assumption about the distribution of the minority holdings. If they're dispersed, a bunch of small shareholders hold uh, the, uh, the minority shares, um, we're going to see the same problem um, in terms of the minority shareholders acting effectively uh, that we saw with respect to widely diversified shareholders. They don't own enough. It's not worth their while. Uh, they don't have the means to monitor. So you get a Berlian means problem with respect to monitoring the controlling shareholders the controlling shareholder over a different kind of performance issue than uh, with diversified shareholders. Um, what happens? Well, um, it's, it's very hard for them to monitor. Um, uh, even effective courts won't help a lot if, um, uh, if, the, fina if the vehicles for financing uh, litigation isn't available. Uh, and uh, interesting, it puts a lot of pressure on regulators. In some countries, the regulators have um, been, very, uh, been very effective. Two uh, examples, uh, Brazil, uh, for reasons peculiar to Brazil, the Brazilian stock, exchange, the stock regulator has become extremely active. Uh, the other uh, example is Italy. Uh, because of reforms uh, that uh, went into place when a, a colleague of ours, Luca Enriquez, was on CONSAB, uh, both the rules and the enforcement of um, related transactions uh, have become uh, have become important. Now, there's a puzzle with respect to uh, controlling shareholders um, that uh, Zohar uh, raised, uh, but I just want to frame because I don't yet know how to answer it. Um, the first is uh, if the controlling shareholder can't make a credible commitment as to the level of be personal benefits the controlling shareholder is going to take out of the company. And that may be the, um, um, uh, the ego satisfaction of running the company and directing its, outpu its output. Uh, it may be uh, uh, self-dealing. Uh, it may be deciding whether your kid is going to be the chief executive officer, an issue which we've ducked in the United States. But replay in your head the Disney case that was talked about. And imagine that instead of it being, uh, instead of it being uh, the head of creating, uh, creative arts, it's the 29-year-old son or daughter uh, of the controlling shareholder, who may be a perfectly sensible person, but nobody believes for a second that if they did a full, if they did a full search, that would be the person they'd come up with. And if you think the hypothetical is far-fetched, think about News Corp and Murdoch's effort over the last 15 years to make sure that one of his children uh, survived him. Um, if, 
it becomes very hard for a, for a minority shareholder to decide what they're going to pay for a minority share unless they have the ability to evaluate whatever you know, the, the contract, as Zohar would put it, about how much the manager's uh, going to take. So you know, in countries where you can't rely on an effective legal system and enforcement, why do people buy minority shares at all? Why isn't the right number of minority shareholders zero? Um, uh, second, um, why would those companies ever issue equity capital? Because the, with the discount, the cost of capital is going to be enormous. Uh, maybe that's why in concentrated groups we like to own a bank, uh, something that Israel's been dealing with um, recently. That's a harder question. I'm going to pose uh, the last couple of slides um, the, um, the part that I can sort of get at. One of the things that um, equity intermediation does in a controlling shareholder system it overcomes the Berlian means prod prod problem with respect to the minority shareholders because it turns the minor minority shareholders into minority block holders. And that may not be the same. In some jurisdictions, it give, effectively gives the minority block holders the ability to put an independent director on the board, and it's an independent director that they choose, not that my, the... Not that the controlling shareholder proffers as somebody who is independent. So uh, the Italian, um, Italian, uh, 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 these are some numbers about uh, concentration, they're still the same, but um, the um, Italian, in Italy, slate voting essentially gives minority shareholders the ability to name a independent director. It's been a great boon for Italian per, uh, economists and law professors. Uh, uh, Lu Luigi Zingali sits on the Telecom Italia board. Uh, Guido Ferrini has had them. Um, Sweden, um, uh, Chile has a, a interesting system where cumulative voted is, voting is mandatory. There are six, there are six uh, state sanctioned but not state owned pension funds. Uh, le the legal rules give them explicitly the right to coordinate with respect to naming a director under cumulative voting uh, and, um, uh, and requires them to vote only for an, for an independent director. So you're still left with um, the question of the controlling shareholder still has control. What is it that a minority block holder can actually do? Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, uh, institutional, uh, institutional structure can support minority board members, uh, minor, excuse me, minority uh, block holders. Uh, transparency matters because the public implications, at least in this world, of disclosure about controlling shareholder behavior has an impact independent of formal enforcement. But the nice tie between that is that legal rules provide a lot of support for informal, uh, for informal rules. Um, we'll, um, so the one thing then, that as we begin to think about this shift in controlling shareholder regimes, is to begin to understand both the informal enforcement mechanisms that are available and the manner in which legal rules can influence the capacity of the informal rules uh, 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 to work. Now, here's the, uh, here's the last point, and that will cause me to, um, that will cause me to, that would just said zero minutes. Um, I did skip some slides. <laughs> right, well, with this group, it's very powerful. <laughs> um, the interesting, I mean, from an academic's perspective, the interesting shift um, is to reflect the fact that the notion of having controlling owners is not just a function of small capital markets uh, and circumstances where there aren't 
uh, uh, there isn't effective law enforcement, the sort of standard academic take on it. We see it happening in Silicon Valley more and more frequently. Part of it reflects the uh, concerns that Zohar raised. Part of it reflects the fact that uh, a, tool, a dual class stock is simply the founder deciding to keep an option uh, on control. Uh, and it, the cost of that option uh, is pretty small because they can always adjust it. But the second part is that it will push the legal system toward looking at the sets of issues that Zohar raises, the sets of issues that the Chief Justice raised, with a degree of intensity that it hasn't had before. Because the, block of the minority block holders are going to end up pushing things. Last point, the other piece of information, of data you want to understand the system is the percentage of the, inst the block institutional block holders' positions that are held by foreign, by foreign funds. Sweden, it's 40%. Um, it's growing in Chile. That changes the game a lot because it makes the, the minority block holders more aggressive, which at, when passing the, um, the normative judgment, the game, the game is changing in the US in general. It's changing in controlling shareholder systems. And the change is being driven by changes in the capital market and shareholder d diversification. And it's now the legal system's uh, opportunity to respond. Thank you. Thank you.